So welcome everyone to today's IPC and MCPD Building Masterclass. My name is Julie Kennedy and I am your host all the way from an extraordinarily windy little cottage on a lake in Zeeland in the Netherlands. So thankfully for this because the house is creaking all over me and hopefully I won't be carried away to sea while we're on call. Now, our star speaker today is Teresa Mack, a compassionate mental health professional, and she is going to be talking about something which I consider an excellent topic and a very real one, maybe even a somewhat taboo one, and that is compassion fatigue in coaches. Excellent topic. So first, some housekeeping. Our call today will be a maximum of one hour, including 15 minutes Q&A. The session is recorded, so please mute yourself unless you have a question that you want to ask live. But do keep your video on, if possible, so that you know makes it feel nicer for, for the speaker in particular. We have a chat box where you can put your questions if you want to keep them till the end so that you avoid you know, forgetting all about them. Um, and otherwise, just feel free to uh, raise your hand during the session and, and ask your question. Otherwise, we'll be taking the questions at the end. So that's enough from me. Over to you, Teresa. Thank you so much. Yeah, welcome everybody uh, who's here. Um, I thought before I start with the topic, I explain, oh, are you going to admit people? Yes, no, I, no, do, no. I do, I do. Fantastic. I'm automatically like, oh, another one. No, no, don't worry. I'll do it. I'll do it all. And yes, I, I didn't mean you have to turn your camera on. You can if you want. It's nice for us, but no worries yeah. if you don't want to. Yeah. Um. So I thought before I start and before I start, start, I have to uh, preempty. If you've been to Zoom meetings, you know, there's always going something wrong. I tried to whisk through all my slides and then the circle of death came. So if the slides get stuck, I will still be talking to you and we can uh, send them out. A lot of them just have pictures, but maybe the resource slide, if uh, you can't take a picture in the end, I, we can email this out um, or otherwise you will be able to get this. So before I start now with um, the teaching, I thought I explain a little bit about how I came to this. Why would I offer this class? So um, I've been working as a mental health professional now for over three years, and I offer um, mental health support through coaching and mentoring. And um, in mental health, you come across other mental health professionals, and um, that's where I first learned about um, compassion fatigue. So it's when in, in a helping profession, that could be nurses, carers, um, could be coaches, anybody who works uh, with people, they really struggled with switching off, you know, like weekend, evenings, and they were still thinking about their clients. And that has a really profound effect sometimes on their job. And they just had to leave their job and they couldn't do it anymore. So I then thought, because I'm doing mental health and coaching, is this actually also a thing for coaching? I reached out to our organization and since then have spoken to a few people and was surprised that, yeah, there is actually interest and people often don't know how to recognize uh, the difference between burnout and compassion fatigue. So I'm slowing down a little bit. What you're going to learn during this 45 minute masterclass. So we want to be able to distinguish between burnout and compassion fatigue because they can feel really similar, but they are different. And what's most important, they need like different interventions. So um, I will also suggest a few things for you to create your mental health first aid kit. And um, we discuss how to set boundaries and embrace imperfections because that would really help you with your compassion fatigue. Um, so before I ask you to put the numbers in, you know, when you call a helpline and say, please listen to all the options before you press the button. So I would just like, and I can't, I don't dare to click on the chat. So please tell me what the result is, but I would like to ask you to put a number in for one, two, three, or four. So one is I've experienced burnout. A two would be I've experienced compassion fatigue. Three would have I've experienced both and put a four in if you're not sure what it was. So I just give you 
um, a little time. And then, um, like I said, if I click on that, I might mess up the power. No worry, I'll I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, so we have one, one. So one, four, two, three, two. So we have a mix. Two, three, two, four, one. Mm. Um, I'm not going to ask you at the end again, but just keep your number in mind and see if you might change the answer after. So let's just start with um, the difference between them. Like I said, they are really very similar or they could feel very similar, but you need to like almost treat them a little bit different. So burnout can happen when there are too many demands put on you. So at work, for example, your colleague leaves and all of a sudden you're doing the work of two people. Or you have no support with looking after your children um, or looking after your elderly parents. Um, some people, their health is suffering and they just keep pushing themselves. Society, um, unfortunately, really wants to encourage us to just keep going and get up at four o'clock to become a millionaire. And so rest needs to be earned. So there's a lot of stigma around burnout as well. I think it's slowly changing, but I would say that burnout is caused by us ignoring the signals of stress. And we just keep going until we then are totally burned out. So compassion fatigue on the other side is more when the client's demands um, or the frustration of them not changing, maybe they you, you, you really try so hard to work with them, but they're not really implementing the agreements. Um, also, you can have secondary trauma, like you might be coaching for a job, for a business. Stuff happens in their life. So if they then come to the next session and they tell you something traumatic that has happened in their life, that could be a bereavement or anything else, it could trigger either your own experience, your own trauma in your life, or just your compassionate person. And listening to someone telling you something horrible that happened to them, that can really, really affect us. And so it's a slow erosion of caring. And that doesn't make you an uncaring person. It's just, you just don't have the energy anymore to really care. Um, or they decide something that you worked on triggered their childhood trauma. So we might have an idea how the session develops. We might plan, but there could be things happening that they are unplanned. And we need to be also a bit prepared for them. So burnout and compassion fatigue on the outside can look really the same. And there is something else, and I don't know if anybody has heard about it, and you don't have to really, if you're not working in that field, remember it, but it's called vicarious trauma. And this happens mostly to people who really work with um, traumatized people, so firefighters, um first aiders on on the scene like you know the manchester bombing happened so the people who rushed there to help uh paramedics nurses on an a and e ward doctors so these people the trauma they witness can alter their view of um life their values and the world and of course you could also have depression um, and although I work in mental health, I'm not going to really go into this because if you think you are struggling with depression, then please go to your GP and get some help because it might need to be medicated or so. Um, and also, I want to stress that by looking and or becoming clear, is it burnout, compassion fatigue, you might prevent then going into a full blown depression. So. I thought let's change the narrative because if we look at a problem, we often look just at the negative. So you might think I'm going beyond and above because I feel easily guilty. I'm a people pleaser. I have imposter syndrome um, and sort of 
almost blaming yourself. And one of these problems, when I started years and years and years ago, I started as a grief recovery uh, method specialist first. And I thought, because I can help, I have to help. And I felt really guilty because I started to feel a bit resentful when people would challenge me why I wanted to charge or if I said, well, I, I can't help you. And um, so there's a very negative side of it. But what is if you're just a really compassionate person? Maybe you've discovered the solution of a problem that you suffered once from. I don't know if you've heard, um, we all write the book we needed to read. Maybe you are just the coach that you needed when you were struggling and you just want to help people. So why not go beyond and above? Um, so there is not just really a negative thing. You might have really, really good reasons to be that compassionate and give it all and go the extra, extra, extra mile. Right. So I believe there are three steps to change. And um, that's the method I work with. And it's awareness, challenge, and change. So you are here already. You want to grow your awareness. You want to have information. You want to maybe explore a little bit what that means. We can't change what we are not aware of. Uh, you probably remember there's always a film where a couple or two friends are at dinner and the one goes, you've, you've got some spinach between your teeth. If you are not made aware of or you're lucky to look in the mirror, you're just going to smile at people with that green in between. So we need to become aware first what the problem is. And we don't want to blame the clients or just the stress or ourselves. It's not about laying blame is really about how can I do things different? So once you're aware of the problem, then you can challenge your beliefs. Like I challenged my belief. Well, do I really have to help everybody because I can? And I realized it took me years to get to that point. And I invested so much money and time and effort to learn what I learned. I just was used to, from my ch own childhood, I had to be emotionally caring for my parents, no matter how I felt. Um, so part of my behavior was actually a trauma response. And if you keep doing this, then you're not going to be a very good helper for or being able to service people because you're just going to switch off at some point because we just can't do it anymore. So I think to then make some changes because you're challenging the beliefs of society maybe or for yourself, that's so important because if you're a coach and I appreciate not everybody is a coach here and I hope you still find that useful because we can have compassion fatigue with a friend. I don't know if you ever had a friend and all they do is moan about their relationship, how horrible their partner is or what's happening at work. And first you go like, oh yeah, that's just, dreadful and maybe you try this and try that and then you realize they're not really asking for advice they just want to vent and you feel awful after listening to like two hours of venting and at some point you're just like I can't hear this anymore I feel really down after having this conversation with them so then we start to change things so what can we really do and I'm going to compare burnout and compassion fatigue again. So burnout really requires a reduction in stress. If you, for example, struggle too many requests at work, if you are really burned out because the kids need you and there is no one to help you, um, if your elderly parents, re you know, life changes, we, we just get older we, as women, we go into menopause. So if we were able to do something at some point, but then all of a sudden, maybe your parent gets ill with dementia or you don't feel so well, that's all added stress. And trying harder is not the solution. 
So you need to find a way to reduce the stress. Compassion fatigue on the other side, it requires boundaries. And I'm going to go into the explanation a little bit further on. But can you see how that's already different? Because compassion fatigue is your relationship with the people you help. Burnout often comes through all the demands that life puts on you. But both require self-care. And I know from all the people I've talked to, so many people and myself as well, I feel the more compassionate and caring you are, the more you struggle with self-care. Um, and maybe we have time at the end. I would really hear if that's like an experience people have. So I think, so now I'm talking about how to manage the compassion fatigue. And I think it's so important to manage the expectations of the client. Um, we do this by contracting. And again, you might be a coach who has learned that in a very specific way, or maybe you do more like organic coaching where you said, I had this life experience. Uh, not everybody is accredited or uh, certified. I appreciate that. Um, so contracting is, and for the people who are not coaches, when you have a chemistry session, so that's your first meeting, and you sit down, the client tells you what their needs are, what their problems are, and then you share with them how you could maybe help them and how you work. And it's so important to set this up from the beginning because it's so difficult to later on change. You know, when habits crawl in, it's, it's really, really difficult to change this. So we have really important agreements in contracting. So for example, we need to explain confidentiality and safeguarding. Because if you work with someone and you really like them, and then you have to break confidentiality, that can be really, really difficult. And you might feel really, really guilty of doing this. So we have to, of course, everything should be confidential, but we have under certain circumstances, we have to break confidentiality. So we might be worried that the client might harm themselves or others. And then there are a few laws. So it's the Terrorism Act, the Drug Trafficking Act, the Road Traffic Act, or if we get a court order. And it's really important that they understand that this is a professional service. They might be Facebook friends before they become our clients. And Facebook friends is like, you might never have seen them in person. You just, but you already have to, uh, a different connection to someone who hires you through LinkedIn for your service, for example. So we need to be really clear on where the line between um, the can't doesn't even have to be friendship, but you know, you really like each other, you get on really well, but it still needs to be a really, really professional relationship. And that will help you then to close down. I'm not thinking about them over the weekend. I'm not trying to help them. I'm not doing a lot of research to sort their problems because we are not a crisis service. Um, so we need to also let them know what happens when they are late, when they miss a sessions. So there's a lot to, the, the clearer you are with yourself, within yourself, the easier it is then to prevent compassion fatigue. So another thing is opening times. So I really like to communicate with my clients through Facebook Messenger, but everybody can see when you're online with that little green dot. So imagine you're feeling good and you're scrolling and maybe you're messaging your friends 11 o'clock and all of a sudden your client pops up. If they don't only have access like for a phone number where you can have a work phone, and your private phone and the work phone can be in the other room, can be switched off. And they message you, do you know already 
do you have like boundaries inside first before you put them into a contract where you go, yeah, I can completely ignore that. Or do you feel compelled? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a bit late, but okay. Or you just might be okay with messaging them. But what is if they do that another time? You're really tired. You're struggling yourself. You're annoyed with life, whatever it is. And they keep messaging and they're like, I really need your help. I really need your help. So that's not really a question I ask you to answer now. But if you had that problem or you might be at the beginning of your coaching journey and you want to really prove yourself to the client, but have you explored actually how to behave with this? And then the other thing is, what would you do if they message you like, yeah, I'm thinking of suicide. Do you know how to behave like that? Maybe there are coaches who never had that problem. Um, but it would be good to have like a plan B. And these boundaries, they can really help us um, to be clear, to keep us safe, to keep the client safe and to not fall into this trap. Like I have to be available all the time. That's what social media changed, I think. You know, before we had a phone, I was tied to the wall. Um, people only could call you in certain times and you weren't available 24-7. So let's look at self-care. You probably have heard, can't drink from an empty cup. I think our cup is never empty. We are not car tanks or phone batteries, because when they are empty, they just stop. So we have the ability, even if we are really burned out, we, we can still function. Um, makes sense. In cave times, you were in the wilderness, the snowstorm comes in, you can't just go like, oh, just wait that out here. It's like, no, you're going to die. So you need to conjure some energy out of nowhere almost and you go to safety a lot of us live in that state of emergency for years that is not what the ability was meant for so i believe that our cup is either filled with joy and energy and happiness or with resentment and overwhelm and stress. So I'm inviting you now to do a little exercise with me. And it's called the in-between exercise. So that's the good side of drinking a cup of tea. So I invite you to sit down and close your eyes. And in real life, of course, you would do this with your open eyes. But just, just follow me here. So imagine you sit in your chair and all of a sudden you think, oh, I really fancy a cup of tea or coffee. And the in-between is the transition between rooms, which we often just go on autopilot. That's why we probably, we go into another room and we go, oh, I can't remember what I was doing here. So you sit in your chair and you stand up and you pause. You feel the feet on the floor. If it makes it easier, imagine you're a film star. Because film stars, they don't slouch into the kitchen, do they? They know all their eyes are on them. So what is your posture? How does the light come through the window into the room? What does the temperature feel like? What are the noises you can hear? And then you walk purposefully into the kitchen. You take the kettle, you walk over to the sink, you fill it, put it back, switch it on. You go to the cupboard, you open it, you get a very special cup out. You go to the cupboard next, get your tea, coffee, sugar, whatever you need out. Maybe you go to the fridge and get the milk out. 
and you make this tea purposefully. That's why they have these tea ceremonies in some countries, isn't it? Because it's not about gulping some hot drink down. And then you sit down. And before you sit down, you, you hold the cup and you feel the warmth. And you smell your brew. And then you taste it. You really, really taste it. So you can open your eyes again if you like. How often are you telling yourself, I need to take a moment for myself? And then the phone call comes, another client, someone else needs your help. And when I start working with clients and a lot of my clients, because I, for some reason, I end up working mostly with people who have experienced significant childhood abuse. And although we are all individuals, there are very similar issues we have. Overwhelm, stress, haven't got time, feel guilty, feel selfish if I want to do something for myself. So if I would say to them, can you take 15 minutes out for yourself a day? They can't 15 minutes. I haven't even got five minutes. Hey, come on. And then I go, can you take 1% of the day? Because nobody can tell me they cannot take 1% of the day. That's 14.44 minutes or so, just shy of 15 minutes. So we need to change the narrative. How do we judge what we're doing? How do we judge the expectations that are put on us? And how do we judge the ability of us to, to deal with this? Because no one is going to come and hand you over a 15 minutes extra, like here, at the end of the day, here, there's my gift. No, you will need to claim this for you. So... I'm sure you all have chopped onions or something else in the kitchen. And all of a sudden you nicked your finger and you started to bleed. I hope you didn't hold it up and go, oh, I need to go to Boots, buy some plasters. No, you hopefully go to your drawer, you get some plasters out and you help yourself. Because we do this when we don't need it. We go shopping and, oh yeah, need some plasters to prepare for the eventual. So you might have a first aid box or like I just have a drawer with a few things. And why do we never do this for our mental health? It's almost like we can accept that we have to prepare for physical things like probably if I proof it for your headache or anything else, but we never do this for our mental health. And then we run into crisis and then we have a waiting time of six months or so, or we decide, I just can't do this work anymore. So this could be your mental health first aid box. You can call it pumper box, a comfort box. If you had a bereavement, you could call it a memory box. And you do this again when you're not in crisis, when you're not burned out, when you're not in compassion fatigue. You do this on a good day and you fill it with things that give you comfort. Chocolate wouldn't work for me. I just couldn't keep it in there, but maybe you can. Maybe you put some bath salts in, a candle, a first aid journal where you collect inspirational quotes or you write in how you feel. Maybe a playlist of your favorite songs. Um, at the end in the resources, there is from the NHS, they have a PDF with prompting questions like, what are my triggers? Who could I ask for help? How can I avoid this? What? So I would not just print this out. I would just get a really beautiful journal from a shop and then fill this all in and decorate the box, make it a mindfulness experience. And then, you know, it's somewhere safe. And when you're in crisis, you can then use this. Pour some water. I'm sure you all have heard the expression. You can't make the horse drink. This is not in your job description. The beyond and above 
I think that's often used when we give extra service because we want to have a high quality service. But there is a limit. And if we go over this limit, that's when it becomes harmful. So first you might be really enthusiastic to help your clients and they might really be enthusiastic to change. But then they realize actually there is more to it than I thought. Or like I said earlier, something happens in their life. Maybe it's just not the right time in their life. And we want to embrace our imperfections because maybe for the area they need help, we're just not experienced enough. That's okay. We, we grow and learn by experience. Or we make mistakes sometimes. Or like I said, we're just not a good match and their expectations were not what we can deliver. And that's okay. We are human. We, are, we should allow ourselves and we should be honest to our clients and within ourselves as well that, oh yeah, I've reached my limit with this. I feel at the moment there's a lot of almost toxic positivity on like Facebook, especially um, is the fear. If I let people know that I struggle, how can they then book me? How can they? But I, I have a coach. I need coaching. We're not supposed to be the helper and the one that needs help at the same time. We're not to suppose. I mean, we can help ourselves probably better than other people who have no coaching experience. But it's okay that we still need help. And we, that doesn't mean we can't help other people. We can still help them. So let's change the narrative again. Maybe it's not selfish. It's self-preservation. And I invite you to feel inside you. How does that feel when I change this from I'm selfish or I'm preserving myself? And in the resources, there's a really good book. It's called Not Nice. Um, because people think to be kind, I need to be nice. And I give you an example to prove to you that it's actually not the case. So imagine you hate going to the cinema. I don't like it anymore. It's too loud. To, just like, I don't know. I just don't like it. Imagine my friend asked me, so, oh, I, this new film is coming out. Would you like to come with me? And I'm like, oh, I don't want to let her down. So I make up a headache. I'm just like, oh, you know what? I really don't feel so well. She now thinks I want to go to the cinema, just not on that day. A um, week later, she's going to ask me again, what am I going to say then? So wouldn't it be so much better to be emotionally honest and say, do you know what? I don't really like the cinema, but I would love to spend time with you. We could go for a walk or go for a cafe. And then the friend can say, oh yeah, great idea. I know another friend I can ask. Our fear is that we are letting people down. But I'm not letting her down. I'm not telling her I don't want to spend time with you. I still want to spend time with her, just not going to the cinema. So being kind and being nice are actually two different things. So let's look at some reasons why you might want to be emotionally honest and preserve your energy. You will be leading by example. How is a client to learn if they can't actually see that you do? We, we learn from other people what they do. You're permitting others to do the same because then it becomes okay. Oh, it, it's okay to say no. No is a full sentence. You're preserving your well-being. So we don't have to wait till we are in crisis to stop it. We can feel good and say, here is my limit. You will be showing up with so much better energy for your clients. Can you imagine they could feel that you just don't have the energy to care anymore? How sad would that be? And all because we had this erroneous idea of what serving means. And we couldn't allow ourselves to change things before. Stress and demands on us, they will be coming all the time. Life just, it's never ending. It's really never ending. If I don't have enough petrol in my car 
and all of a sudden that street that I might have managed to go to the next petrol station is closed and I have to go the long way around. I'm not going to make it to that petrol station because I'm already so low. So this unexpected road closure is just going to throw me. So we need to be well enough. When something else comes, we can deal with this. You're being kind to yourself. How can that be selfish? How can be kind to someone? And that should include us. How can that be selfish? And you're protecting your health and your mind. And also you will grow your resource list to share with your clients. The more you learn about boundaries and what to do for yourself, of course, you're going to share it with your clients. Why wouldn't you? So let's have just another look on the whole thing. I think that burnout leads more often to a sick note. It's called a fit note now, I think. I don't know why, but you end up going to your doctor and say, I can't do this anymore. What is if you're self-employed? That is so much more difficult. Compassion fatigue, on the other hand, is like this slow erosion. We just quite quit. We just like, I can't deal with this anymore. And all our enthusiasm to help people because we are so compassionate, it just fades away. And maybe we feel disappointed, maybe in our clients, maybe in ourselves. And again, burnout happens when we have too many demands put on us and we try to do so many things at the same time. We are only human. And again, it could be a trauma response where maybe compassion fatigue is more like, oh yeah, I can help people. I'm, I know this and this is amazing. And I know how much better they can feel with my coaching. Um, so compassion fatigue is often a result of the secondary trauma. So hearing too much from other people, what happened to them. And also like, you're putting it all in and then they come back a week later and say, oh, yeah, sorry, I haven't looked at the resources. I didn't have time to do this. And if that happens over and over again, you're like, what is the point? We're not moving forward. And also feeling helpless, not being able to help them any better or thinking at the weekend of all their problems or they contacting you and you're like, oh, maybe I should just quickly help them. So. Um, if you like, once all the resources are up, you could take a picture or we can send the slide out. So the first one is a really good TED talk. It's quite funny as well. And it's about what self-care really is. And maybe you will be surprised. Um, this is the PDF I mentioned earlier. So it has these questions and really take your time and explore them. And like I said, you can either print it out and answer it, but I would suggest get a really, really nice journal and maybe a special pen. That's a joy to write in. There are a few books. Um, I Believe in Me by Vicky Wargan is a six weeks course, but she has a group as well. She's doing it over three months now. So one week is reading and then one week is implementing. Um, and it's really, really good because you have little exercises every day and it can really change how we see ourselves and how we care for ourselves. If I say no, I feel guilty. That's one of my favorites as well. He's got exercises like the broken record. You might have heard of that. Kids are really good. Mom, mom, mom. Oh, yeah, I'm giving in. So if you have a demand, you can just stay very calm and repeatedly state the demand without being fopped off with any excuses. And then the not nice um, is really the difference between trying to be nice and trying to be kind. And when we say yes to another person, we don't really want to say yes to them. We actually say no to ourselves. And he also has this free 10 day course. So you can just go on there and you get these videos and uh, things to do every day. Um, this is another free course. Um, 
about self-care and this is one of the exercises she suggests and I think that's so simple and so lovely can you imagine you work in an office or you have your own office and you put these red dots coffee machine printer I don't know what else so you go there and you see the red dot and you go <sighs> I think that's a lovely simple idea we don't need to take a full hour out. That's so unrealistic. It's some little bits and pieces and little moments that we can really make a difference to us. And then uh, Daily Com, they have a little bit text and they also have a course. I'm not affiliated uh, with any of these. Um, I think the Daily Om is always, they have like free prices and they say it costs that much, but you can choose what you want to pay. But there's just a buff, uh, there's a bit nice information about self-care. And then if you recognize that you work with clients who might come into a crisis. So um, in my contracting, I specifically say that I'm not... Um, a crisis service and if they want any numbers from where they live i can give them some numbers to call we never know what coaching can trigger in some people um but in your area where you are there is probably a safe talk it's a free uh, and a half hour course and is for suicide prevention and you learn task so task is you tune in for example it's things what the client said like well, that's no point. I'm not going to be here next week anyway. So they might not mean they're going on holiday. So you would ask, are you thinking of suicide? Does the ask then state the seriousness? You would say, oh, you know what? This is really serious uh, and I would like to get your help. And then connect is when you connect them with someone. So I'm a suicide first aider. I would be, for example, a person you would connect to. And... Last but not least, um, I have a doodling exercise, if you want to have that. It's a PDF, and it can help you to connect a bit, bypassing the conscious with your subconscious. So if you have a question like, how can I better care for myself? We don't want to think about it. We want to see like what else is coming up. Um, or you want additional support, I also have a course, a four-week course, Proactive, I'm doing if you want any more information. Um, you can scan the QR code or click on the link. And I rushed through this. It's <laughs> not 45 minutes, but I hope it was helpful. And if you have any questions, I think I stopped sharing now. That would be... <sighs> Good. Thank cool. you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. First of all, I'm, I'm back. I think the, the storm caught up with me. I was unceremoniously launched right out and it took me ages to get back. So I'm so grateful I made you co-host. Otherwise, <laughs> I would have taken you with me. Um, oh, no. Teresa, I would, first of all, very personally like to say a big thank you to you. Somehow I believe that we listen to what we need or that we're given the chance to hear something that maybe we hadn't really been 100% aware of. But somehow, for me personally, I must say you have triggered a lot of things, a lot of realizations um, I'm the one who put the four, so I wasn't quite sure if we're talking burnout or compassion fatigue. And uh, I thought this was an excellent talk. And as I said in my yep. introduction, I do think we should talk more about this because as coaches, and I think we are all coaches here, um, this is something that we do usually come across at one moment or another. And mm -hmm. we're sometimes not prepared with how to cope with that, wondering if we've chosen the wrong profession, if there's something wrong with us or whatever. Um, so thank you for that. It was at the same time very deep and very practical. Um, I hope the rest of you have been scribbling away as much as I have. I have uh, certainly written down a lot of tips. Now we have the chance to have you know, there were a small group live, you know, the rest will be on the on the Facebook live or in, uh, you know, re-listening. So feel free uh, to, in all honesty, unmute yourself. Let's have a discussion. Share any thoughts, questions, comments that you have, um, because this is a really important topic. How, how did how did you all feel about it? Was this new? Have you encountered it? Do you want us to go back to our 4321, uh, Teresa? 
actually, I think if, well, yeah, people can choose. You can either put a number in or say, yeah, that has changed or um, I've been thinking differently about this now or you can just um, unmute. I know this is like putting people on the spot and they're like. Yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, no, I shouldn't no. do that either. That's terrible. No, it's, it's okay. But does anybody want to say anything? Have there any question or just a comment? And it doesn't have to be rocket science, you know, just anything. Um, uh, can I jump in? Yes, go ahead. Um, Sorry. Um, so I'm not a coach. Um, I, uh, I'm i just a, like a very compassionate person as well. So, <laughs> so ADHD and autism runs in my family as well. And so like one thing that I've always struggled with specifically is kind of uh, um, being more like emotionally intelligent, I guess, being more emotionally connected. I would feel quite overwhelmed, e like quite easily and stuff, but I would care for other people quite quickly and quite easily as well um and so one issue that I had like I didn't even know it was a thing to call like something called compassion fatigue or something I was just like I just thought that it was just something that oh it was kind of just something that I experienced or or um and something that I couldn't really change um like for example one like last year I was doing my final year at uni well, it was my uh, it was actually my master's degree um, and I made uh, a new friend there and she was really struggling and so me and my twin we kind of adopted her into our friends our friend circle um, because we we knew how it how it felt to kind of navigate a world where everything feels like it's a struggle and so because we understand like we we know how it feels when you're struggling. So we, whenever we see our friends struggling, we're like, oh, I want to do my best to make sure that they're not struggling. So anything that I can do to help, I'd like to do that. But the thing is then that she would always come back to us and we would be the pe person that she would vent to. And it happened time and time again, and it didn't feel like anything positive was happening. We would, we would give some positive suggestions, you know, stuff that she could try and change or, uh, you know, try and like uh, maybe change her the way that she thought about herself and stuff like that but nothing ever seemed to like change and so we felt ourselves slowly like withdrawing from that friendship and now we don't talk at all anymore um and it just felt like really kind of just like frustrating because it's like oh we knew we had this good friendship but we just couldn't emotionally be there anymore and um now I can see there was clear signs of, of compassion fatigue that we just couldn't we didn't know how to put those boundaries up and so we ended up lo losing a friendship um mm -hmm. and so this was really really actually really helpful for first awareness <laughs> and also challenging that mindset as well and like you said like I am also a kind of a people pleaser so you know making sure that I can draw these boundaries so that in not in not only in my personal life but in my professional life in general that I can be more have more energy for the stuff that I want to do um so yeah thank you <laughs> you're welcome I think it's a very good point as well and I must admit the the, the friend compassion fatigue also rang a bell with me as a few two people who for 30 years but then you get to the point where you think that maybe some people actually define themselves by being yeah the victim or you know and then it's a choice of you know where do you put your boundaries as a friend judith were you going to add something i'm um, just going to say how wonderful the talk was and thank you for that and um just to say as well about the highly sensitive person um mariana mentioned autism and uh ADHD is one I think you said and I think um highly sensitive people also can fit into a not wanting to label but that their energy battery gets drained very very, very quickly and they can ex experience extreme compassion and fatigue because they just so connect so deeply with everybody so just putting it out there in the mix really but um no oh, that you. is a really good yeah, yeah. Teresa, do you want to say anything about that yeah um thank you very much for saying this and i think that's often when we don't know about these things i don't know about you guys but i always feel like oh it's my fault first there's something wrong with me like what you said julie and um, it's so easy and um, I'm now diagnosed with autism and ADHD as well and just the awareness has helped me so much because I don't think anymore there is something wrong with me I just like for example I also have chronic fatigue and uh, pain so I challenge myself to put my calendar different instead of oh everything is so amazing um, I'm like now you've got so many 
meetings in that day already, you're not going to pack everything to the brim because I know that is really not good. And how can we serve the people if we don't take care for ourselves? You know, we want to teach them this. And then, and I think the problem with friendship, I have a brother like this. Oh, someone is, someone else is coming. Now? Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Um, uh, so my brother is like this and I had to, there is a, it's called gray rocking. I don't know if anybody knows this. It's like where you slowly, like you, you make yourself less and less available. So oh. the first time I came across actually personal experience of compassion fatigue, but I didn't like Mariama said, I didn't know it's a thing. I didn't have a word. It's probably like 20 years ago and my brother was in really dire straits and we were walking through the uh, forest and, you know, I was listening and I was sharing my thoughts and two hours. And then it turned out he already had spoken to like four or five other friends. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, hang on a minute. And I realized that he had this pattern of he wants confirmation about how what a poor person he is, you know, how hard life is it's like this victim state and I know I cannot help him. So I just had to withdraw myself because it drained me so much. And I think that's why these um, chemistry sessions are really important as well, because you need to really develop that feeling. Is that a client that it's not only about the money or how wonderful it is to help people. It's really good to develop this knowledge. Is that actually someone who is coachable? Not everybody is coachable. So it's not how much I want to help them. It's how much can they receive the help. And this is something I really learned in my job in mental health. Um, because it's so easy, especially when different agencies are involved. It could be social service. It could be a mental health support. It could be a key worker. Sometimes people have so many people trying to help them that they develop this dependency and this learned helplessness. And I have, I work for a really, really good organization and they really hone in that you do what you can, but you have to step back and respect the autonomy of your client. And it's not trying harder. It's like if they might even want the help you know it's not like people pretend they were, they really want the help but there is something that's stopping them and we are just limited in how much we can help them and i think with friends and family we we are too close and this is when we just have to then slowly withdraw i i was thinking well when mariama was talking could there have been any different way to rescue the friendship or so but I think these people, and I'm not blaming them, it's just their learned behavior or their trauma response. That is what they need in that moment. And it's not our job and it's not in our capability to change that. We are not therapists for them. We don't do counseling. We don't do therapy. And we just have to respect their autonomy and learn that I might feel rejected, but that's a me problem. And I have to work on that and allow them to leave my life then. So much wisdom there, Teresa, to be honest, in just those few sentences you've just said, so much, you know, for, about that learned helplessness that some people do develop, about the fact that, you know, it's not because we can or want to that we have to save everyone and it shouldn't go at our cost. You know, Judith, I think that was great that you brought up the highly sensitive because often the highly sensitive are the ones who are the ones who want to care the most and who want to help others. But we're, I may say we're, because I'm one of them, we have a tendency to then, it's not helping because we're taking on their pain and their frustration. And that's where I got to the burnout, not sure, but that's why I put the four, because I realized at some point that obviously I was also, it wasn't very professional because their pain or frustration or whatever it was, was becoming mine, which means mm. that I was getting too close to it. Um, so let alone, I was less able to help them, 
but it was also taking away my energy and my life state, which it should never happen, obviously. Otherwise, you know, how are they going to come to me? It's a bit like, you know, if you give all your oxygen to somebody else, then you're going to collapse in a heap. And, you yeah. know, you, then you're no help to anyone, let alone yourself. So that was also very wise what, what you said there. Um, and it is all about boundaries. It is about expectations. It is about being aware of ourselves as well so that we can maybe better help other people to move forward and there's only so much we can do you know that learned helplessness you spoke about I have two people in particular in in my life who have that and at first I thought you know it was a great occasion for me to try different things to recommend different books and courses and different points of view etc and I remember very well one of these people we went for a maybe one and a half hour walk along the coast and during one and a half hour, she complained about how awful she feels that she always complains. Mm. And by the end of that, you know, I mean, I actually got quite bad tempered, so I almost lost her as a friend. I'd known her for a long time, but I said to her, I think it's time that you stop looking at your belly button, go and help in a soup kitchen or go and see people who have real problems because, you know, you're not, that's not a problem. You know, this is really a luxury what you're talking about. And I was very harsh. So I'm not saying that that's what you should do, but some people, as you say, are not coachable and they don't perhaps don't even want that. They just want to rant and rave, but maybe they can go and rant and rave to somebody else, you know, and yeah. not always the same person. I want to say something, but I'm just answering Catherine's question. We are finished actually now. I'm really sorry. Yes. I hope you can you can rewatch the yes. we start at 3 30. So I hope you can rewatch uh the um recording. I'm oh, what really you. triggered um Sorry, yeah. Yes, um, sorry, so, Catherine. Yeah, it's just fish, but you will be you. able to watch the replay. Oh, I wasn't sure if there would be one. I was thinking yes. I would be better watching that. I'll do that. and I'll Because you've I'll missed leave. something exceptional. So if you're interested yeah. in the topic, I would certainly encourage you to listen to it again because it was extremely good. Oh, thank you. Well, thank yeah, you. I'll, leave, I'll leave you just to finish off, but I really appreciate okay. your kindness. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so you. just to wrap this up, so... One thing that triggered me when you said, oh, I then stopped um, recommending books and, and things like that. And I'm like, yeah, why shouldn't we recommend them? It's like, you know, it helped. You know, this this book or this course or this whatever speaking to the ter person can really help them. So I think it's our natural instinct. We want to yeah. share what helped us. So why shouldn't we? But it's to recognize the limits of the other person and the limits of us. And just to wrap this up, I wanted to address the new coaches, the people who just enter this, like, don't give up too early. Oh, my God, my journey started in, I did my grief recovery in 2016 um, and then started to work with people a while after. And then in the last three years, I've worked with so many people through my job as well. It does get better. And you cannot know what we know when we are experienced. You you just can't. You Or you're very lucky, you know, like you're natural and, oh, good luck to you. But that wasn't my experience. And I think other people have something really similar, that you have to go through these experiences. You have to, you cannot imagine, you really have to experience that you catch yourself one day and go, ah, that's what they were talking about. I tried so hard and it didn't work. And I'm really sorry that you can't just, you really have to walk the walk. You know, there is no other way, but don't give up and don't think you're the only one that struggles with that. Even seasoned people like us were like, oh no, well, here again, you know, it's like, yeah. And then you catch yourself and go, okay, learn from that. Exactly. Do something. It's all a working experience and we experience it in different degrees. I've been coaching since 2009 and you go through different, circles getting in a different way but thank you thank you very very much for all of these very wise words and very practical advice as well um i mean the red dots is lovely and i encourage us all now go and make a mindful cup of tea where we walk like film stars to the tea <laughs> to the kettle and really smell it take time make that our little moment and it's only you know five minutes can reset us in a way which makes the whole day better and we don't need to keep charging okay. for it. So thank you, Teresa. Thank you for all of you for having shared your insights as well. Write it all in your CPD books. I forgot to tell you to get your CPD pads out. I'm going to get told off. Thank you. And um, yeah, good luck with all of you. And, and, and as Teresa said, we mustn't give up. You know, we have this in us and it's beautiful. All the very, very best. I shall go back to my 
storm. <laughs> Bye. Take care. Thank you, Take care. Thank you yeah. for hosting you. and stay safe. Take, Take care, care, everyone. Bye. Till the Thank next you. one.